you know, the M-Pesa example, um, that was Safaricom, Vodafone. And then everyone went, oh, this is amazing. We should do this across the whole of Africa. Um, but it didn't happen because certain nations didn't have the government's access to the foreign investment or the government support of the community to do these things. Welcome to Africa Tech Talks, where we discuss the latest trends and developments on technology and innovation in the African continent. Joining us today, we have Chris Skinner, who is a leading expert on financial technology and author of several books, including Digital Bank and Digital for Good, who is also the founder of Financier, a website and newsletter that provides insight on the future of finance. Before we get started, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more great content. Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, um, we, we understand that you learn a lot about um, about fintech, or you talk about about fintech and uh, tech in general, and how this disrupts the the building blocks of banking, the building blocks of uh, our economy these days. Um, what do you see, uh, and based on the competition? Uh, that exists between banks and uh, the newcomers, the fintechs, what do you see that will be the future? Will the legacy win or will the, the fintech disrupt? Well, the key thing that a lot of people do not understand, and particularly startups, is the regulatory environment of banking. And I put it on a similar level as the pharmaceuticals industry, for example, which is if you produce drugs that kill people, then you will, you will be jailed. And so this is the reason and the protection of the traditional financial firm, which is they have a license, they're overseen by a very heavy regulatory oversight uh, by government, mainly because the banks are completely integrated with government to control the economy. And so fintech doesn't disrupt. What I normally advise fintech is try and do what the banks do badly, such as online payments or mobile payments, which has been the biggest area where we've seen change and um, startups succeed in Africa. Um, or try and do what banks just don't, do not do at all, which is serving the communities that are less well off, providing financial literacy, um, managing uh, finance for kids, those sorts of things. But don't try and replace the bank because it won't work. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So uh, legacy, legacy uh, infrastructure as well as the regulation is mainly what keeps the banks running and the regulation keeps people safe from mistakes that can happen with these uh, new technologies. Um, on the other hand, and from from what uh, I've also heard from you, I think years ago, um, you, you talked about the microcredit and um, the and making the newcomers or the, the people from Africa especially come into the new banking system. And how do you think that that will uh, disrupt and what's the importance of this to, to the, um, in your opinion, to, to the continent? I mean, I, on my side, it's particularly true in African nations because a lot of banks were only serving what I would call the, the wealthy um, in those nations. Uh, and we, you know, we started seeing the big change with this, with M-Pesa in Kenya. Um, and I always remember chairing a panel. So M-Pesa is now 15 years old and I chaired a panel with M-Pesa. And I said to the CEO, um, how do banks compete with you? And his answer was, they don't. They try and copy us, but we focus on the customer. And that's where we focus on our delivery. And I remember going to Ethiopia and being very surprised, and this is five years ago, that they didn't have a lot of mobile payment structure. And yet now we see, you know, a lot of mobile payments and um, fintech companies in Africa changing the game. So things like, and companies like 
chip his cash or Fori in Egypt or in Interswitch in Nigeria. Um, and Flutterwave obviously is one of the ones that I'm most familiar with. Um, and I think what we're seeing is what I just said, which is these companies are serving communities that never had service. No one bothered. And that's where FinTech, particularly FinTech Africa, has seen the biggest growth and in investment. Um, and of course, there are neobanks like um, Ope in Nigeria, um, which I think are interesting. Um, and Ope, maybe like Newbank, that's my favorite um, FinTech in South America, um, can change the game. But what they're doing is they're not trying to replace the banks. They're trying to serve people who never had service. Yeah, yeah, and, but but do you think? Sorry, uh, go go ahead. Yeah, Chris, uh, do you think that eventually in those markets they found a more open uh, regula regulatory environment so they they could uh, just come and and, and scale? Uh, I think there's a couple of things here, which is um, in many countries, and China is a good example, um, we've seen stellar growth of tech and then a stellar crackdown on tech. Um, and the government in China, specifically when we look at Alipay and Alibaba, allowed them to grow with very little regulation or oversight and then change their mind and suddenly crack down. We saw the same thing in the peer-to-peer -peer lending markets in China. And China is a, a much more uh, restricted environment than most in the world. And I think the danger is that governments allow technology to start to um, do things that customers feel they can trust. And then eventually they say, oh, you can't trust this. And it goes back to the point I was making about the traditional banks, which is the reason why banks are trusted is not that they anybody likes them. It's that the government says, if they fail, you get your money back. So what's the guarantee if you invest in these technology companies, particularly in financial uh, platforms, that they will protect your money? You know, if you suddenly find yourself enjoying a hundred thousand dollars or however much it is in bitcoin on, on an exchange and the exchange collapses tomorrow what's your guarantee what's your protection you, know, you feel you're rich and then suddenly you've lost it all and that's something that drives a lot of people into very bad places and we've seen this with ftx terra luna and a lot of things that happened like celsius in the last year in the cryptocurrency marketplace and so there's a balance you need to have, and this is actually something I'm um, writing my next book about, which is um, decentralized finance is great. And I think for transactions, it's great. I think particularly for African nations, cryptocurrency transactions, and we've seen this particularly in Nigeria and other countries is great because it allows you to do immediate transfer to someone peer to peer with no bank involved and no fees or small fee um but if you stored your money in there if you had this hundred thousand dollars or whatever amount you had and it disappeared overnight you need to have some form of central governance you need to have some oversight and the big question in my own mind is decentralized versus centralized cryptocurrency versus central bank digital currency and at the end of the day i've always said and i still say it, you can't have money without governance the question is, what is the governance? Who is the government? Is it the network of the people on the internet? Or is it the head of state in your country um, and the central bank in your country? And that debate, I, well, that will continue for another you know, few, well, may, maybe decades. Because as far as I remember, you, you had um, many years ago this view that one of the biggest differences that we have uh, from the past systems based on COBOL, I, I think you bashed COBOL a little bit, um, is that today we have the opportunity to, to do direct payments, right? So uh, this, this is the opportunity 
to uh, to decentralize everything. And at the same time, um, now that we have this opportunity in hand, we are also seeing this clash between the opportunity and the dangers of that opportunity. Um, but don't you think that this will happen and this is inevitable that, that it happens? This uh, decentralization? Well, there's pros and cons. Um, obviously, the advantage is that we can own a lot more of our life the disadvantage is that some of us are not very good at owning our lives i always remember talking to some people about empowerment in the workplace and they said i don't want to be empowered i want to be told what to do and so there's a kind of dichotomy there and i'd say you know a large amount of the population actually don't really want to have to think about all these things they just want it to be done for them um yeah. rather than having to do it themselves and so that there's a balance there and um the, the balance question is obviously how much is the state running your life versus how much do you run your life and there's a big movement towards even more decentralization because for example When we ask this question, we think about social media and Facebook uh, or Meta as it renamed itself, um, even though they've got the Metaverse, um, yeah. which you can come back to if you want. Um, but, you know, um, Google and others have this control over our lives that's even greater than governments because they have all our data. So decentralizing the ownership of data is a big challenge right now. And Tim Berners-Lee, who was the gentleman who... created the paper that created the World Wide Web is run, narrowing a company to decentralized data ownership. So you have your own compartmentalized piece of the internet. And if you share data, you do it on a encrypted basis and limited to only the data that's needed, not access to everything about you. And I think, again, going back to the argument I'm having about money and it being decentralized and centralized, we have the same argument around data. and who owns your data and if you own your data how much do you want to share about your data with governments hospitals banks and others um and there's a big battle going on between those two camps some saying right now governments hospitals banks google meta own our data we should own our data indeed indeed I don't know, Manel, uh, you had a question, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, I think uh, it's it was more about the, what you said regarding to to fintechs in Africa and how the thing has been spreading. Um, based on our experience in, in Angola, um, I have been working more in the distribution. And what I understand, um, normally the companies involved on the fintech uh, ecosystem in Angola They are more con more concerned with the technology uh, instead to look ahead to to the services that people need to be provided. On the other hand, we have the same questions in the banks. It's about we are discussing about uh, financial system, but we talk less regarding to income that people need to transact. That people needs. Uh, we, if we look, for example, for the needs that the people with the low income has normally in in Angola, uh, they just need money to transact. They live. Most of the people live from what they earn each day, uh, and it's quite difficult for for them to sometimes to trust in the platforms that don't allow. in some ways in the um, immediately the money that they need to 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 mobility to to buy food or anything else because uh, because of the fact that we still have a lot of problems regarding to networking connectivities so is an of issue that we see that can has been affecting the trust in the um, in the fintech ecosystem that we are trying to reach on the other hand in the banking system regulatory framework is very important i totally understand with you chris and agree with you when you said it's that some uh, startups uh, getting in, in the fintech space doesn't understand 
the the framework for uh, regulatory framework from the banks it's an of issue that we already seen but on the other hand is the distribution to understand the people behavior people behavior the uh, the value to help people especially if we are talking about the mass market if you are talking about the people that just that just live uh, or just eat or move himself with the money that they they get in the day so the time the the, the fact that you can do process instantaneously uh, transactions has been affected a lot the way this kind of technology can can spread in in our reality yeah and i and i think you know, when i look at the um and i only, only discovered this in the background research to this chat today about the palops you know Ecuador, yeah. guinea angola and the countries in the portuguese speaking nations yeah. um obviously there's a lot of people who don't have the wealth to be served by a bank and th there's an interesting discussion there because traditionally the reason why banks only deal with people that have high, higher income is they were distributing through buildings with humans which yeah. andre you'll know that's a regular theme that i have um, that cost model of buildings with humans means that you have annual contracts. You can only serve someone with an income above a certain level. And as a result, that's the traditional model of banks. When you look at the Palops and the nations that we're addressing in the Portuguese speaking Africa, um, and also in the rest of Africa, like Ethiopia, um, you know, the majority of the population doesn't have that income to get a bank account. And that, that to me has been the massive change we've seen in the last 15 years, thanks to mobile, which is, um, I didn't address at the United Nations and this was about five years ago. And I said that every single person on earth now has access to financial services and payments to trade, transact and talk thanks to the mobile telephone. And I saw a lot of people in the room, you know, raising their eyes going, oh, what's this guy talking about? Um, which was a moment for me that reminded me of something I said even longer ago, decades ago, which was someone would eventually make a payment on the top of Mount Everest. And in 2015, Standard Chartered did a publicity exercise where someone made a payment on the top of Mount Everest. And the fact is, to your point, Manuel, that yeah. you know, everybody in Angola, everybody in the um, African nations and South American nations and Asian nations now have access to finance, to trade, transact, and talk, thanks to the mobile telephone. It's a fantastic inclusion um, capability. And uh, I think, Andre, you may have heard me talk about Digital Human, which is a book I produced a few years ago. But within that, I specifically went and did a case study that was very in-depth about Alipay in China. And the fact is that Alipay with Alibaba and uh, WeChat, which is part of Tencent, have transformed the Chinese nation in 20 years, thanks to technology. Um, and that inclusion of everybody, I still believe is the most important point that, you know, people say to me, oh, but I don't have a mobile phone, Chris, so I can't afford one, I'm too poor. And I said, well, do you know someone who has one? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I actually don't believe anybody's too poor to get a phone, but if they think, if they are too poor to get a phone, the bound to know somebody in the village who, or you know, who has who has one, and if you can find that person, you can trade, transact. Yeah, the the, the approach that we have seen uh, in our institution, especially the traditional institution that are trying to move to eco to fintech ecosystem, uh, it's about in, instead to to be to provide the service, it's about how to get the money that there are in informal markets. It's an approach for us very difficult to have uh, because um, we have been discussing in our fintech uh, talks many times uh, regarding to the normal services uh, or a kind of financial services that the, the population needed uh, has been provided by the product, owner, product owners like Nestle, for example, like other distribution companies that own products and exchange with the money. So they give credit uh, they give uh, other conditions uh, with the less cost than banks, for example. And now they are trying to move to the fintech ecosystems locally. But what we see, what we have seen is the difficult that they have to, to change the approach 
because the approach for them is how to get in and take that money to put in the formal system instead to be uh, how we can provide the services aligned with what they have of course we have uh, a lot of things that can be difficult the exchange rates the margins that banks want to have the kind of in infrastructure that banks has uh, and also uh, it can cause it can be costly for them and also for for the population but on the other hand for the fintechs we have seen a lot of difficult to integrate with the bank system uh, locally on the other hand in terms of funding and to grow the platforms um our ecosystem to fund companies to vcs is very weak very weak we don't have enough money in the in the our in the our system to to long run this time of investing and supporting the fintech growth and also uh, they build the narrative of uh, building us a fintech with ten thousand dollars <laughs> just looking to to the front page for the for the the front end of the platform and not from what we have in the back not only about the customer acquisition, but also to understand the the daily basis from the people that we are providing the, the services is one of the things that we have seen. And this space we see has been occupied, not by fintechs, not by the banks, but the distribution companies and brand owners, especially because uh, uh, for the for the lower income population, what we have seen in more than 50% of the income, they spend buying food foods and mobility and those services uh, are addressed directly by the, the providers of the services so in, in terms of the company that are in the middle to to facilitate the transactions uh, what we have in terms of offer doesn't fit for what they want for example the mobility you pay in cash not even in in, in card uh, the food, if you are like in the B2B relation, uh, you will get credit from the Nestle or other distribution. You don't need to borrow money from the bank or to have like uh, a kind, uh, uh, any kind of services, uh, even micro micro credits to 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 use this. And the margins that they normally use is about one two percent, and in the bank our exchange rate is about seventy percent. Are they right? Seventeen. Seventeen, yes. Seventeen percent. Seventeen in Angola, yes. Yeah, in, in Angola. Uh, on the other hand, we have a lot of part of our country that is off grid, so and and we have a very disproportional country because we have we have almost ten million people in Rwanda. But when you go out of Luanda to the other provinces, you have like um, a long distances to find a few population. So yeah. which makes it difficult to, to reach them. And those population in terms of income, the, um, the difference is huge, you understand, mm -hmm. on the other hand. And in terms of logistics to provide the service and even a network for, for these populations, it's very difficult because of the access uh, to reach the, those areas. Uh, and even if you reach those areas, the number of people that live there, if, are, if is enough to connect, uh, to invest in the connectivity. And on the other hand, we have the issues regarding to the power, power light, to the energy. Yeah. So right. even in Rwanda, we have to put for uh, each. How can I say antenna, Andre? Antenna. For, yeah, for any, <laughs> any site for for communications, you have to put a generator, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you had a, you yeah. had it you had a trouble right the right before yeah. entering. You had the yeah. a power shortage, uh, right before yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. This is this is what happens. Yeah. But, in South Africa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think in, in those are uh, some some issues that we have seen that has been like a kind of difficult. I think we can move on, of course, but when we talk about the scalability uh, locally, that we believe it will happen, is some of issues that we have to address. Not putting aside the regulation, it's very important to to fix it. But in the nature, the 
the way the society works every day in the daily the daily basis are a lot of a lot of issues that we we have to 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 address to address yeah Chris, let me just do one 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 paragraph here very to to connect uh, because uh what Manuel was saying was uh, regarding um the the distribution channels being the biggest um the biggest uh, providers of credit in in the continent but you also uh, entered with the uh, uh, you also talk a lot about having uh, a POS you having a POS everyone has a POS and you you just mentioned it i don't know if you're going to cross that but i would like to also understand where where you come from in that uh, in that perspective Okay, I, I mean, and also, Manuel, you covered quite a lot of different points there, and I think it's interesting in that, um, first of all, going back to the countries that are Portuguese-speaking in Africa, um, there's a lot of connect connectivity between there with investors in Portugal and Brazil and USA. Um, you know, so I, I think there's some interesting nuances in that discussion. Um, but specifically to the point of distribution, there's now a lot of work that's gone on to take offline payments. So using QR codes, for example, you can do uh, an easy way of making payments without having actually any electricity or network. Um, and that will generate further, I think, into more contactless systems where you can connect um, you know, at, and pay without actually having to have any bank or network involved um how that will work long term it's still to be seen yeah. um but you know obviously there are challenges i, I mean i've been in a lot of situations that i, I think the ch the main challenge is actually uh education in that um a lot of people don't know they can do these things or they don't have anybody who can explain them to them um so i've traveled around many countries in africa um I won't go through the whole list, but I've been surprised at the variety and that some countries like Nigeria and Kenya have been leading a huge revolution in making finance a available to everyone. And yet in other countries, I mentioned Ethiopia earlier, although this has changed since I was there, um, it's been a lot slower. And, and part of it is also then, and something you touched on, Manuel, which is data that the interesting part of what happens when you make the mobile network available to everybody is then you get the data about everybody that goes with that and um by by way of example there's a fantastic unicorn that's come out of um africa called isuzu which i don't know if you know them mm. and i'm not sure i pronounced it correctly but yeah but they're actually focused on the u.s markets but they're founded um in, in africa um and they're all about getting data about people who are looking to rent a house um and klana from europe for example the founder of buy now pay later i interviewed some years ago and the key thing for them was that the more data they have about people then the easier it is to offer credit yeah. um so isuzu Klarna, many other companies are focused on how can we get data about people um and and the core of how Klarna started was on postcodes zip codes saying if we know where you live what street you're on then we know what sort of person you're likely to be um and i think that's what's going to happen as the next you know, movement post mobile financial inclusion is data building data gathering around people even if they're in a remote village. And I know you're right in terms of the power issues and the remoteness of some people, because I've been around Rwanda, for example, and, um, you know, Zimbabwe, and I've seen that a lot of people just pretty much don't have anything. But it goes back to the point I'm making, which is even if they don't have anything, they probably know someone who has a mobile phone, which therefore gives them access to trade and transact. You know, my presentation some years ago was saying, you know, the remotest farmers in any part of Africa can become an entrepreneur if they have access to a mobile phone. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you 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 have touched uh, now 
a question that I'd like to, to ask you is about the, the, the what made those countries that you have mentioned, particularly Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, more, say, uh, moving faster than others uh, in terms of this uh, financial inclusion, uh, mobile, uh, financial mobile inclusion, uh, uh, that the other countries are not doing or not probably need to read to, to do. So what was really different there? Yeah, that's a good question, Vitor. It's also not necessarily the easiest, but in my view, it's um, the way in which government and investment, and particularly direct foreign investment, has moved. And so when you look at... Um, you know, the M-Pesa example, um, that was Safaricom, Vodafone, and then everyone went, oh, this is amazing. We should do this across the whole of Africa. Um, but it didn't happen because certain mm-hmm. nations didn't have the government's access to the foreign investment or the government support of the community t- to do these things. It's quite astounded me how quickly Nigeria has changed because um, I dealt with quite a few Nigerian companies 10 years ago. And um, at that time, I would say that people were sort of looking at this and going, not sure. And now we have most of the unicorns in fintech that have been invented in Nigeria. Um, And I think what changed there is that there was huge population, obviously, very young population, very visionary, um, a government that decided this was an opportunity and therefore supported um, not just companies, great um get, getting investment and foreign investment but actually giving them the tax incentives and support to do that and that always makes a difference and i say this about every fintech community worldwide which is if the government is not giving you the tax structure and a talent structure um talent to as in the people um to grow your business then you'll go to where you can find that and i think um nigeria it's interesting because, you know, 10 years ago, we would all say it would be South Africa, Cape Town. Yeah. Um, but I, th- I think Nigeria has really set the marker. And the reason is that they have a young population. It's very visionary, a government that's giving the right structure to grow and incubate those businesses and support um, overseas investments in those businesses. All right. I yeah. think when, when... If I go back to your nations, you know, what what's what are the governments doing to bring foreign investors in from America and Portugal and Brazil? It's yeah, it's it's quite quite difficult um, to to have it. Uh, not only because of the regulatory framework that we that we have. And also, I think in terms of uh, getting investment, we can provide some some other kind of uh, opponent for to receive money. Just a simple process to to transfer money from Europe or from America to Angola is very, it's quite difficult to have. On the other on the other hand, we need to have some kind of stability in the market that allows investors and gives them some confidence that you can put money uh, in an Angola company. And you have stability, even like um, currency from the, the currency during, for example, five years, it's quite difficult to have it because we are still very dependent of the oil business. Uh, we are very exposed to those commodities and all the volatility regarding to, to this. On the other hand, uh, we, we speak a lot locally that it, for me, it's hard to understand to, to to, to defend the idea that a country uh, don't need to invest in research and development to, to, to grow. It's very difficult to, to understand that. And in Angola, we have a few steps, a very huge steps that we have, we have to, to have in this kind of situation mm-hmm. to build like an investment in education, research and development. I think Nigeria, Nigerian, Nigerian guys do it, they have done it. Uh, when you talk about to Nigeria, about to 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 Kenya, the proximity that they have with the U.S., for example, helps a lot. To U.K., 
helps a lot. You have this kind of mindset that you build. Uh, unfortunately, we don't see it locally uh, mm. in, in, in that way. Uh, we don't invest. I don't know if you saw the the report of uh, global competitive uh, uh, ch uh, challenge. Yes, the report that was launched the, the final of the last year. And if you see for Angola, the actually the numbers that we have for invest in research and development are very small or practically inexistent. So for the for the investors. Uh, in my opinion, I think it can be difficult to put money when you see that locally there is no investment in research and development mm -hmm. on those areas. It doesn't so, mean just about the technology. It's about to understand the, the, the society, to understand what drives your society, what drives the people, and, and where you will invest. So I think we have a long journey to, the, to do. On, on we, also, we also talked to couple of weeks ago uh, with the VC and he was telling us that uh, the legislation is in Portuguese and there's no translation. Yeah. So it, it, I think it's also a barrier. Um, so transfers, um, not knowing the place, not having this kind of channel that we are opening now to, to make it more available, the knowledge of uh, what's happening in Angola. Yeah. I, I think everything is... Um, not in our favor, let's put it this way. Um, but there are initiatives. Uh, hold on. So how are you going to change it? Yeah, we are, we are, uh, we are, uh, we are building this. We have uh, also opportunities. There's um, um, interest these days from some, I mean, people that have power in the country and that are, were involved in oil business, for instance that are trying to enter in this field of um, developing fintechs and developing tech in general. We, we haven't seen it yet coming, uh, but there's a lot of talk in the, in the corridors and there's uh, we, in, uh, all of us and more people that we are involved with, we are trying to make this, uh, we're trying to make this happen. Um, it's hard because if we if we move to try to get people from abroad uh, to invest in Angola, we face the challenges that Manel was talking. Um, transferring money is difficult. See. The, the compliance system from banks is very yeah. hard. There's also a component here which is related with the history of the country. I don't know if you, if it's uh, common knowledge, but before 2014, to invest in Angola, to, for, for a foreigner to open a company in Angola, you would need to invest at least $1 million. $1 million, yeah. It's already million. changed. Yeah, it, it's already 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 changed. And based on what you said, Andrea, we actually we need to be, we must to have more open to, to the other languages, to the other countries. I think we have been a lot of discussions regarding to fintech ecosystem in Angola, but what we see is like uh, door closed discussions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think is very difficult to disrupt on to, uh, and also have the different ideas. For example, if you not involve the different kind of stakeholders, if you not involve the people, for example, that live every day, the the the, the people that can provide you a good guidance, guidance to to what's happened normally. Discussions about fintechs with the banks, they are discussing about the bank's perspective. Discussion, discussions that we have regarding to the some fintechs that are open in the market, they are discussions, they are discussing at the same level. So it's very between the same language, between same people, uh, and same views, uh, they are not so open to bringing different people, different mindsets, and at least exposure our fragilities. And I think it's very important to to be like a, a door open to to get more um, to get more knowledge and to learn more from the others, from the other, from different experiences. So it's one of the barriers that we have. Is it, is it the same in Mozambique and Equatorial Guinea and the other countries? 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Eventually, exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought Mozambique is surrounded by English speaking countries and probably, uh, they yeah. are influenced yeah. by, uh, and they are very influenced by, by South Africa. So yeah. Mo Mozambique. I think in some more in some ways are literal uh, are like uh, a bit above of Angola because the proximity with the South Africa can influence the the way they 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 move on on this on these steps. Uh, in our side, I think it's more limited to to be to be frankly. Yeah. And you 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 have mentioned uh, especially in the education and and. Uh, talent development as two key issues. Uh, and I think we have to start somewhere in Angola and that those probably would be two key areas. Um, do you have some benchmark or <laughs> do we have to, to, to do that, that road uh, by ourselves or is there any benchmark or someone did, did it uh, properly? Uh, so. How how to start uh, from that side as well? Well, obviously, it goes to how you bring up children, and um, you know, one of my favourite lines is, "We need to teach children things that machines cannot learn," because yeah. machine learning, artificial intelligence, is going to take over the world. So, yeah. what is it that machines cannot learn? And obviously, a lot of that is to do with creativity and humanity and relationships and empathy. Um, in that, yeah, you know, everyone's excited right now about Chat GPT, which is this new AI engine with Microsoft. Um, but Chat GPT couldn't answer a single question unless somebody had already answered those questions somewhere online. So it's just sucking knowledge from other people online. Um, and particularly as we talk about talent generation, again, I'll go back to looking at China and India, for example, in that um, both nations made a concerted effort in the 1990s to get kids to learn about technology and now you see the fruits and results of that investment um in fact there's a great book that um i picked up at an airport in india called if god was a banker um and it's actually a very funny book um written by a guy who used to work for citibank uh, in mumbai i think and um he started as an intern and ended up um, becoming a CEO of a bank himself um, and has now retired quite rich. But the, the story is just interesting because in 1986, when he became an intern, uh, he joined Citigroup. And um, he doesn't say Citigroup in the bank, in the, in the book, but I, I know that it's Citigroup. <laughs> so, um, and the, the American CEO who took over Citigroup India um, was sent there because he had messed up big time in America and therefore it was kind of a demotion at that time. Whereas <laughs> today it would be a promotion um, because the tables have turned. Um, but right now India is still you know, an interesting country because although we've seen so much success from the investment in education, um, there's still a lot of issues that we see in African nations about reach, inclusion, remote villages um, and education generally um, and specifically right now I think the issue in India when we look at technology is they've built the nation on being the world's favorite outsourcing place um, and and developers place um, but as AI and automation takes over all of those functions and that now I can get all my questions answered by a chatbot that's more intelligent and more empathetic than a human um, the world is changing. I don't know if you saw this, but there was a survey done in the US about two weeks ago uh, where uh, 200 medical questions that came from patients were given. Yeah. And um, the answers to those questions, uh, the patients prefer the answers from the chatbot run by, well, chat, run by chat GPT than the answers from the medics because the medics are not that patient with patients. No. <laughs> yeah, this is this is going to be quite insane, uh, service-wise. I think you you posted on Twitter uh, a few days ago something about that uh, regarding the the what's going to change because yeah, humans are getting less human than 
the the chatbots with AI, which is which is quite interesting. Um, but at the same time, and from from this perspective, um, African countries that are not as developed as uh, Indian or uh, India in this case or China. Um, we still have a long way to go, and we still have to bet on digital, di, sorry, digitalization of um, the education. We can't, we can't uh, miss that. Uh, the The question is, should we go there, or uh, should we go into the empathy and the more uh, human relationship uh, based education? That's that's something that is going to that that is going to be a question a very question for the next for the next years and to see uh, what is it what what do you think about the digital central currencies because this is a, this is something that is yeah. emerging all all all, all yeah. over the world uh, we've seen that Nigeria is already working on that and um, see me this year yeah. yeah. What do you think about this, and how do you think this will disrupt or stop disruption? Well, most central banks are producing central bank digital currencies, as we call them, CBDCs, on the basis that they are worried about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and uh, XRP, Ethereum, um, Cardano, Polygon. There's many of them out there. But the newest one I've seen is called WorldCoin, which... Um, is going to be based on uh, iris recognition as a biometric and founded by three guys, one of whom is the founder of ChatGPT. Yeah, Sam, uh, Sam Aldano, I think his name is. Yeah. Um, just got a $100 million investment value in the company as a unicorn. So um, the challenge is going back to what I said at the start, central versus decentralized. Yeah. Um, and most governments are doing CBDCs purely because they're worried about decentralized finance and the big point here and this is something that i regularly talk about as well is um that the internet and technology and the mobile network does not recognize angola or equatorial guinea or mozambique or you know south africa zimbabwe ethiopia uk or usa it's a global network mm -hmm. it doesn't understand those borders and in fact if you look at the world in reality we don't have borders we just created them because of history and because of empire building um and when we look at cbdc's they're trying to maintain their empires and their country's borders and that's very difficult to do when you have a network that's out there in the wild and is creating something that doesn't recognize your country or your border so the biggest challenge, to be honest, with governments is regulating the network. And yeah. this is what, again, goes back to my argument around decentralized versus centralized, that the network of citizens is now saying, well, we want to rule the world through our network without you interfering with us and our data. And the governments are all saying, but we have to run the network. It's very much, it brings to mind the Arab Spring, it's a decade ago, but you may remember when suddenly many Middle Eastern countries um, rose up and tried to bring down governments and many succeeded. And I remember in Egypt that um, you know, the president cut the lines to the internet and then suddenly, and this was the most interesting point, um, all the world started to use text messaging to mobile phones in Egypt to keep yeah. the uprising supported. and. You know, this is the issue. How, how do you stop the network? Yeah. That's, that's the thing you probably can't. And that's probably what's going to happen is we will try to fight it with CBDCs and everything, but in the end, give it time and we will have a, a central um, currency or, at least, or many currencies that uh, don't have to obey it to, a, to a central government. Well, my prediction, and it may already be coming true, but um, SWIFT, for example, is trying to network all the central bank digital currencies of the world through their network. Mm -hmm. And the G7, G8, G20 are discussing the idea of maybe creating a um, 
integrated central bank digital currency, um, like a basket of currencies that could be used as a, as a stable coin. So then the question is, what stable coin do you want? Do you want the stable coin of your country or of Europe or America or China, or do you want a stable coin backed by all of those currencies or backed by Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? And it's really down to, thanks to the network, it's your choice these days. Having said that, many countries are making it very difficult to get access to cryptocurrencies because they don't like them. Um, and the more difficult they make it, the harder it is to use them. Um, and equally, are they really currencies or are they investment vehicles? And Chris, um, in your opinion, do do you believe that Bitcoin anytime soon will be like a kind of currency that people will use like for a regular basis or it's like kind of, um, okay, can be considered a reserve of, of currency in the the new future, but also if it's kind of is if it's a kind of uh, utopian to to consider that we use Bitcoin in Africa to buy bread and to and to to go to mobility to foods. Do you do you still believe? Do you still believe that if you believe that it's possible to 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 happen with a Bitcoin? Oh, I, I wish I could show you this advert. There's an advert that's running, um, which I picked up recently, where uh, a guy goes to a market store and wants to yeah. buy potatoes. And um, the storeholder says, oh, um, this is only here. How are you going to pay? And he says, oh, I've got a five pound note. And he says, no, nah, it's crypto only. Uh, what about onions? Yep, yeah, crypto only. And that's like... <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, no one. yeah. At the at the moment, you know, people are not using Bitcoin as money. Um, you're not really using any of them as money. Yeah. You can, um, and I think the challenge is it's not easy to use these currencies as yeah. money. Um, they are for transfers peer to peer between us at a transaction level. Bearing in mind, it's not regulated, so therefore you you've got to bear that in mind. Um, but I recently bought a football shirt signed by the Watford team at okay. UK team. I'm not a fan of theirs, but I just bought it because they were sponsored by a Bitcoin exchange mm -hmm. and a signed shirt you can only buy with Bitcoin. And it took me about an hour to work out how the hell to buy it because of the fact I had to open a new wallet, register everything, transfer funds into the wallet, then spend from the wallet. You know, that's not what you want when it comes yeah. to payments. You just want simple, easy trustworthy payments and i think there's a big thing there around you know the average person on the street you know are, are they really interested in all this chat about currencies no they're just interested in getting what they want in fact my, one of my favorite quotes going jump back some years again is no one wakes up and thinks i want to pay for something they think i want something and as a result i have to pay for it yeah. it's something you want that is what your interest is not paying yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Because I, I, I think the the use, the use case that we have in the um, the cryptocurrencies that I believe in some ways, and and I understand that people at least need to be educated to use uh, an exchange. Please, all the all the process that you have to open account, to to transact, to do everything, you need to be educated to use. And I don't have seen like average people uh working it the same way especially if we're talking about to africa uh the idea of using that way like you said okay people uh, wake up and wanting things want to to move wants to to eat and they will choose the e easiest process to to pay and to to exchange in order to to have what they want manuel but, i'm going to interrupt you guys now because we're currently yeah. into our time yeah, and I have a question for you, or for you, you, which is, yeah. uh, how do you think things are going to change in the future, and when are you going to invite me to come over and be there physically? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, soon, soon. Uh, uh, what we uh, believe that is going to happen is uh, we want to create um, a think tank. And something that can make 
things move forward faster. Um, we need we need to have uh, support, and uh, we are talking to the m more people we can and to gather uh, the biggest knowledge we can so that we can bring people here mm -hmm. and make them talk. Look, uh, Manuel was talking about uh, the central bank in Angola. They already created a sandbox so that uh, fintechs can integrate, can play, and can see how this works. But this is all very new. This, uh, this sandbox, um, I, I participated in a fintech uh, company that uh, initiated it uh, five years ago. And still to the date, we've not seen them grow um, to the point that we, we want them to grow. Um, even the fintech that I started uh, with, uh, we, we, haven't, we couldn't launch it yet. So there's, there's a lot to, to do in this. Um, and, and also for this, what we are doing, we, our goal is to involve institutions there, to, to involve the, some VCs that we find locally uh, some banks that we have a good relationship and that are on the way to to help us to build the, the ecosystem, and and it's important to to have you here because it will give us more more strength and more will to involve them and to to promote this kind of ecosystem with more with more knowledge with more involvement and also with more money as well to to put the, the to help the projects uh, moving forward. Oh, very nice to Thank meet you. you all. Very nice to meet you, Chris. Nice Thank you very much. It was uh, we will send you. We will send you the the episode beforehand so that you can approve yeah. uh, after the cuttings. Okay. And no, no, don't worry. I'm 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 happy with the conversation. So just publish it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Chris. Thank, Thank you. Very nice to meet you. It's a great pleasure. Yeah. I, nice say, I, hope, I hope we do meet at some point. We will. Yes, we will. Certainly. Certainly. for sure. Certainly. <laughs> Thank you. Take care now. Bye. 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 Bye.